is a, not as intimidating of a crowd as I thought. Um, I always feel really awkward introducing myself because I'm not, I don't have like a single identity. Uh, my background education, my educational background is in geography, but my professional experience is in archaeology and hospitality and textile design. Um, and then my interests and passions are like very disparate. So depending on who I'm introducing myself to, I always feel like I have to just blurt out a word and define myself really quickly. Um, in 2015, I was living in New York City and I had a studio practice and I was looking for a lot of different artists. Um, and I was awarded a year-long textile art residency and I showed up there and introduced myself to all my peers and mentors and I said something like, uh, I don't consider myself an artist. And I think I just said that because I wasn't selling work or showing work or I didn't have like any academic background in art. Um, and they all like scolded me right away. They're like, are you kidding me? Look what you're doing. Look where you are. Um, so gotten over that hurdle and now I can introduce myself to you guys as an artist. Um, my name is Evelina Raisley and I am a textile artist and designer and work a lot with plant dyes and natural fibers and hand woven fabrics. Um, so <laughs> coincidentally now I am a student of the arts. I'm an MFA candidate at MSU and Today I want to talk to you about what I think good art is. <laughs> uh, so my favorite Latin phrase is de gustibus non est discutandum. Um, it matters of taste, there can be no dispute. Obviously good art is very personal and subjective, but today I'm going to tell you about what I think. <laughs> so what is relevant, engaging, exciting art? Um, this is like the big question for me and I wanted to share with you a little bit about what I think and then a project that I'm working on that kind of encompasses all of that framework. So the first element of that is work that studies the past that really digs into what's already been done and like builds on it, elevates it to a new level. So I think in the age of the internet Creative people are constantly like having great ideas and then typing a couple of words into the Google search bar and being like, oh damn, like that's already been done. The business has already been started, that idea has already been executed. Um, but I would encourage people to just run with it and keep going and building like off of that historical uh, foundation. So the second thing, oh, and this image is a picture of a work by Caitlin Pomerantz that is these salvaged stoops from super historical buildings in Philadelphia that have been reclaimed after new development and placed in a public park for, uh, for use. The second thing is uh, noticing and considering the present, like what's happening right now, whether that's political or social, uh, whether it has to do with feelings or what's going on in the environment. I'm really moved by works of art that consider like the immediacy of time and use it as a tool to connect with people. And oh, and this image is uh, Mary Roethlisberger who did a durational performance piece where she stood on a rock at the low tide mark and acted as a storming for an entire cycle. Um, lastly, adaptation for the future. I really think that good art considers the future in a very like forward-thinking way. Um, there's a lot of really amazing projects that take place over many, many years, and at the very inception, there's this like forward-thinking goal. This is a photo of Rachel Jones, who's a local artist, in a these porcelain slip cast seat banks that she makes. Um, I think as artists and creative people, we have an important role to consider what kind of world we want to live in and how we can make that happen. And um, 
adaptation to the future for me doesn't mean anything like apocalyptic or fatalistic. It's like really taking into consideration a hopeful worldview and how we can create the place we want to live in. So a lot of these projects um, that I really admire are kind of like what I talked about with our dynamic identities. Like they are not just one thing. They don't follow this normative taxonomy of like having one title. They work across disciplines and often collaboratively between different people. So projects that are not just architecture, but they're citizen science, or they're geology, but they're also like a computer program, or they're sculpture, or also a living experiment. So my project uh, is centered around this milkweed plant. And it's a combination of um, species conservation and land use, it's fashion and manufacturing and textile innovation. So it really starts with this plant, the milkweed plant, which is a native plant. You find it everywhere in the country. You may recognize it because it's flower. It's really rich in nectar. So it's an important plant for pollination. Um, a lot of bees, insects, butterflies are really attracted to this plant. It grows in areas that have full sun exposure and often are disturbed. So on the side of highways and open lots, um, agricultural areas, and public spaces. Uh, yes. Also, you might notice it because of the monarch butterfly. So this plant has become a little bit famous because of the amazing monarch butterfly, which migrates over 3,000 miles every year from Canada to Mexico over the course of four generations. So the key here is that the monarch butterfly only eats milkweed, um, it, or it only lays its eggs on milkweed, milkweed and the larva only eat the leaves. So it's really important that there's a continuous flock of milkweed all the way along the migration path in order for these butterflies to make their full migration. Um, monarchs are on the upper nomination on the endangered species list. Their population has gone down 90% over the last two decades. This is mostly because of deforestation and habitat fragmentation because of development um, and also the use of herbicides. So milkweed has that horrible word weed at the end which implies that it's not good. Um, it doesn't have any current commercial value really, so landowners and farmers often mow it down or um, spray, spray it. So you also might recognize milkweed because of its amazing seed pod full of fluff. So this is where my research as a textile designer really comes in. Um, this stuff is totally amazing. It has this thermal capacity, which makes it even better than down for keeping you warm. Um, it's hydrophobic, so it repels water without needing any sort of chemical additives. It's hypoallergenic, and most amazingly, it's buoyant. Each of those little floss pieces is hollow, so it floats. Um, it also has this uh, great history during World War II when the supply of K-Pak was cut off. Uh, the United States was forced to figure out another way to make flotation devices. So there was this you know, citizen collection effort. Uh, this is a photo of kids collecting dry bags of milkweed used for life jackets. And this is a photo today of a very similar collection method in Nebraska. Um, the only commercial use of milkweed that I'm aware of in the country. And it's mixing it with goose down for pillows and comforters. So my research surrounds this floss of processing it, harvesting it, and spinning it into yarn, and knitting, and weaving, and felting it. We used it as fiber fill, and most recently, um, and successfully with the help of a couple of small grants, I've been able to get 
it processed into a non-woven batting to use in um, an application of a jacket. So this is really exciting. The goal here is to create some sort of new material. So there's a lot of energy right now in the textile world around future fibers or smart textiles, uh, things that respond to the chemicals in your body or environmental conditions like light or heat. Um, textiles that use recycled glass or plastics rescued from the ocean. Um, so I consider milkweed a future fiber because of all these things. It, it grows right here in the United States. Um, it's a plant-based alternative to down that's renewable and animal-free. It doesn't have any microplastics, um, and it's biodegradable, and it's a value-added crop, so it has all these benefits for pollination and species conservation. Um, and it has the thermal capacity and the flotation, which make it pretty incredible and special. So this is the project, one of the projects I'm working on that um, is really tr a proof of concept for milkweed as a viable textile. Uh, it's a jacket. It's This is the most recent three prototypes. So um, the goal here is to create some sort of market that can prove that people could maybe grow milkweed as a crop that is commercially valuable um, by creating a demand. Maybe we can figure out a way to grow more milkweed and support the monarch population. So I have a collaborator who's a farmer and artist in Vermont, and together we have this company called May West, uh, where we're working on designing and um, producing a line of jackets. So that's kind of my work with milkweed along the product design world. Um, I also work with it in kind of a fine art context conceptually playing with the idea of buoyancy and uh, migration and the poetics around what could it mean when the sea level rises and all these people are on the move crossing between continents. Um, what if we had a flotational textile? So this is a floor rug that I wove that is made out of milky and it's extremely buoyant. It just like levitates on top of the water. And, So everything we're in, involving the jacket, I kind of compartmentalize under this brand, Made West. So that's our website up there. And if you want to sign up for the newsletter that is infrequent, um, <laughs> you should, because there's some really big announcements I'm sure we'll be making in the next six months or a year. Um, and it would be great to have people involved. And then this is my personal email that you can email me whenever you want. Um, Okay, that's all I have. I wanted to open it up for conversation or questions or comments. Thanks. When will we be able to buy jackets? <laughs> that's the question. Yeah, I really hope soon. Um, it'll probably be like a crowdfunded effort. Um, I'm hoping this fall that there's a lot of steps I need to take before. But yeah, um, there's. I just recently learned a term for this. Uh, problem I've been having which is called the price parity paradox, uh, which is when you have all these values you want to put into your product that end up making it kind of complex. So it's really important to me that it's made domestically and that it doesn't involve any animal or petroleum products. Um, so like sourcing everything and getting like enough milkweed, it's, it's quite the process. But hopefully it'll be happening. Melina, are there producers in Montana that can provide you with enough milkweed, or would you have to get it from elsewhere? So I have heard, and I'm always wanting to hear about where people spot milkweed. The only place since I've lived in Montana, I've seen it, um, and I just went to visit it yesterday. Uh, it's on Highway 89, like on the way to Yellowstone. It's all alongside the highway. Um, 
but there's not a ton of it here. We're not like in the thick of it here in Montana. So, so where do you get it then? Uh, well, my collaborator in Vermont harvests a lot at a farm called Farm Borderview Farm, which is the only farm that's actually cultivating like stands and milkweed. So they're, they have a grant from like the Extension Service and they're trying to do some work with harvesting it. Um, that's a slow process, so they invited us to harvest as much as we want last year. And then, yeah, I harvest it out by Livingston, and also we've looked into just buying it already processed from that place in Nebraska. Um, does the place in Nebraska, do they, can they support several crops a year, or is it just one harvest? So it's super cool how they do it. It's all by citizen collection, so they just, people go out and collect it in the wild and bring it back. Um, it's just once a year, though. It, it is matured by the fall, and that's when you get the seed pods. That's when the monarchs have already used it for what they use it for. So it's, um, you're not like taking anything away from the monarchs by harvesting the pods. Um, but there is this amazing effort to rebroadcast the seeds, and a lot of butterfly organizations collect milkweed seeds to send out to people to plant um, as part of the effort to create more habitat. There was a question over here. <laughs> how much milkweed needs to like create a jacket? Like how many plants or um, <laughs> I don't know the answer to that question. It's uh, depending on how big, you know, the how like puffy the jacket is. <laughs> um, but those seed pods have an incredible amount of fluff in them. Um, it's not a ton. But I you know, I'm by no means looking to make a flotation device with these jackets, but I think it's super cool that it's flotational. So, like, obviously you'd never wear a jacket in a pool. It's ridiculous. <laughs> um, they, the statistic on that is that uh, one pound of milkweed, which is a lot of milkweed because it weighs like nothing, but one pound of milkweed can support a 100 pound person for 10 hours. So, it's pretty cool. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and does it have do you know it has fire retardant capabilities? Um, I don't know, but someone just the other day was talking to me about that and how it does. But I have, don't have any stats, just conversation with someone. Is it fire retardant? Oh, and right. the reason I ask is like, uh, we have some family friends who he develops products for the military and they're always looking for fire retardant. Oh, interesting. Capacity and you know, whatever gear they're. Yeah. Yeah, so the next step for me is um, I just got a little bit of grant money from the Blackstone Launchpad, which some of them are here today. Um, and part of that money I hope to use to um, send the material off to be te like tested for all of these things. Because it would be really cool to have all these stats. Yeah. How can we help you? How can this community help you promote this business? Well, thanks for saying that. It feels really, really sweet to have support. Um, you can, I don't know, I think that the, the crowdfunded effort will be really huge to have support sharing that amongst your peers and interested people. So staying in touch on Instagram or the newsletter to figure out when that happens. Also, if you know of any more you know, venture capital opportunities <laughs> and could use all the money I can get. Um, but yeah, being here is pretty cool. Thanks for this opportunity. <laughs> Any other questions? Is the whole jacket made of milkweed or just the you know? the fiber fill on the inside is the milkweed. Okay. So I've done a few different iterations, but <laughs> The most current two are canvas on the outside and then the milkweed batting on the inside. Before I was like using the raw milkweed and stuffing it into all the baffles and it's like insane. It's so, <laughs> so much work and totally crazy. Um, so come on. <laughs> so where's the, where do the butterflies, what's their path look like? And have you thought about trying to get people to grow milkweed along the path? 
Yeah, so their path, I mean, it's really, I should put a map in, it's really all over the country, but they start like, all over winter, pretty much the same place in Mexico, mm -hmm. and then they kind of move to the southeastern United States for the next generation, and then they keep traveling north. Um, the Rocky Mountains, like, right, they don't like the really cold weather, so pretty much they're everywhere except for right in the Rockies. Um, you find them all over the place, but, and then they ultimately go up to, like, Canada. Uh, I think part of the future focus of this project is figuring out with climate change, like, where the milkweed will need to be growing in, in the future and trying to figure out how landowners and um, farms fit in those spaces. And you're exactly, I was just on my phone looking and it looks like it's moving north. Mm -hmm. you, know, we, you know, supply is moving north because right. of that. So. Yeah. Yeah, so it is, yeah, this kind you know, of glance towards the future is really important. Yeah. Thank you guys for coming.